three things, uh, as you all know, nanotechnology and its application in photovoltaics. Uh, this is also my field of work. Now, before going into uh, directly into the work, uh, first the what uh, question comes is why photovoltaics? What is the importance of photovoltaics uh, standing in 2020? Right? So, to know that, let us first see some data. In 2014, the world population was around 6.5 billion and the annual energy consumption was around 13 terawatt. No doubt it's a big value. Big value. Well and good. Now, uh, even uh, the power consumption is even higher because more we are progressing with technology, more we are requiring powers. Right in, uh, like in uh, 20 years back, we didn't require a mobile phone. We didn't have a mobile phone. Now, at least every household has three mobile phones and that requires a power, certain amount of power. So, as we are progressing, our power consumption is increasing. So, it is estimated that by 2050, another additional 10 terawatt of clean energy will be needed to sustain the current life lifestyle we are uh, now living. Now, the question comes, from where will this extra 10 terawatt energy come? Because uh, coal reserves are uh, exhausting. We all know coal reserves are exhausting. And the alternative sources like hydroelectric power or wind powers are uh, not exactly preferable in India because they do, they don't uh, they can be used throughout the year. And alternate is of course uh, atomic energy, but it has its pros and cons. We all know that. So on the other hand, if we see some uh, very interesting fact that solar energy daily it supplies about 10,000 times more energy to earth than our daily consumption. Imagine 10,000 times more energy is uh, given to us by sun from the sun but we cannot use it. Now the question comes why? Solar cells were, uh, I think, uh, invented about 50 years back, almost 50 years back. So why not solar cells have taken over all over the world and we don't use it? And why is it need? Uh, is it needed for nanotechnology to venture into the field of photovoltaics? Why not uh, traditional solar cells come into play? You see that first we need to learn about the history of solar cells. This is a diagram for a normal solar cell. Normal that is single crystal silicon solar cell. Or we call it the fourth generation of solar cell. It is nothing as we all know it is like just a PN junction with two anode and cathode points and an anti-reflection coating uh, so that light when light falls on it and reaches the junction the photon produces an electron hole where electron moves towards the anode and hole moves towards the cathode and all that. This is a very simple mechanism but the point is to make single crystal solar cells that we see single crystal solar cells all the solar panels we see nowadays are all this single crystal solar cell first generation but first generation solar cell has some problem firstly it requires a single silicon crystal of high purity. Even a little bit of impurity in its crystal can cause adverse effect in the operation of solar cell. It's a difficult because naturally no crystals are pure. They have, there has to be some impurity. Also, the fabrication requires high temperature and the overall cost, overall cost of obtaining this crystal and forming the in, this into a solar cell is very high. This is one of the main reasons why solar cells are not exactly preferable in practical lives. So to overcome this problem, uh, especially the uh, 
purity, crystal purity problem and the cost problem. The photovoltaic scientists came up with second generation of solar cells. What are second generation solar cells? In second generation solar cell or preferably known as thin film solar cells, the single crystal silicon is replaced by thin films. That is amorphous layer or a paste, just like layer of CDG that is cadmium telluride thin film. Oh, this second generation solar cell is quite simple, but also this has a very vital problem. The efficiency is comparatively lower. And there is another main drawback of both this first. Okay, it's called Shockley Quaisel limit. In around 1968, Shockley and Quaisel, two physicists, started studying the photovoltaics using theoretical and the thermodynamics. Using thermodynamics. Using thermodynamics, they came to a rather what to say, uh, they came to a conclusion which is very disheartening. The uh, disheartening conclusion is that they theoretically showed that whatever technology you may use, but a first and second generation solar cell which only has uh, a single layer, single layer solar cell, the efficiency cannot exceed 32.9%. This is something like uh, we say in physics that uh, any velocity cannot exceed C, that is speed of light. Similar is the case. You can do anything, but the first and second generation solar cell cannot theoretically be more efficient than 32.9%. And please note, this is just the theoretical limit. The practical value is even lower. So, should scientists give up? No, they never give up. They always think of something better. So they came up with the third generation solar cell. Third generation solar cells are known as disensitized solar cells. The inspiration for disensitized solar cell actually came from the natural photoconverter, the most common natural photoconverter, that is a leaf. If we remember our biology lessons from class 9 and 10, we remember that uh, leaf has a pigment called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll that absorbs sunlight. So, photovoltaic research has uh, someone thought that what is we apply a layer of chlorophyll like pigment or something like that similar to solar cell. If we apply that layer, it may absorb more in, uh, more sunlight. So, we may get a better, uh, better efficiency in solar cell. This was the idea. But as you know, chlorophyll is a natural pigment, it can be made artificially, so instead they came up with the second best alternative which is organic dyes, that is light absorbing organic dyes. So this is the structure of a dye sensitized solar cell, there is a photoanode on which they have deposited an oxide, generally DiO2 and Z2, the reason for choosing this oxide will come later. Over this, they have deposited a layer of organic dyes and then there is an electrolyte and another counter. A few years back, uh, if you were uh, actually reading this kind of articles, I came across an article that where one of the researchers made a high efficiency solar cell using juice of berry, berry juice. So that solar cell is nothing but actually a form of disensitized solar cell. The berry juice is nothing but an organic dye kind of thing. So using disensitized solar cell, they found that okay, um, the cost is uh, not more than the first generation solar cell, and efficiency is also quite high, at least higher than the second generation solar cell. But like every positive thing has a drawback. Dye-sensitized solar cell also found its own drawback. Firstly, the organic dyes are expensive, comparatively quite expensive. And secondly, which is the basic disadvantage of dye-sensitized solar cell, is that organic dyes are unstable towards water and oxygen. 
So disensitized solar cell may be a good candidate for lab research, but practically no. Because you cannot expect a solar cell to be uh, fit in your rooftop, which is uh, which is unstable towards water and oxygen. What will happen if there is a rain or there is wind? So disensitized solar cell is not exactly a practical solution. Now, now nano researchers came in. This is where nanotechnology comes in. They came up with a derivative of the third generation that is uh, disensitized solar cell, quantum dot sensitized solar cell. This is this can't be said as a new generation. This is more like a derivative of the third generation. We may say what 3.5 maybe generation 3.5. Well, no one says that anyway. So this is quantum dot sensitized solar cell. The structure of quantum dot sensitized solar cell, if you compare with disensitized solar cell, is similar. It has a photoanode, it has an oxide layer, and instead of di, di particles, dyes are replaced by quantum dots. The rest of the structure is same. This is just a representation of solar cell. We will see the practical solar cell in the later part. So, before we go into quantum dot solar cell, first let us know what are quantum dots. Why? Why nanotechnology to be used? There must be uh, some uh, advantages of using nanoparticles in uh, solar cells. So, let us first understand what are nanomaterials. If we go on reducing the size of any material, uh, when, it, when the dimension reaches 10 to the power minus 9 meter, then it can be said as nanomaterial. A nanomaterial can be widely classified into three parts, nanodots or more commonly known as quantum dots, nanorods and nanosheets. Quantum dots, in quantum dots, the particle size is reduced in all the three dimensions as you can see in the first uh, diagram. If the cube is considered as a bulb, then the central colored cube, the brown cube is just a dot. Just a small part, which is a dot. Is, uh, quantum dots are generally said as uh, zero dimensional semiconductors because their dimension is almost zero in three, all the three sides. And the second is nanorods. In nanorods, the confinement or the reduction in size is limited to only on two dimensions. That is, it is an elongated structure of nanodimension. And lastly comes nano sheet. This, this, in this, the electronic confinement or the quantum confinement is just limited to one dimension. So, if the quantum dot doesn't have a length, breadth, or height, nano rod has only length and breadth. Uh, doesn't have length and breadth, only has height. And nano sheets have length and breadth, but no height. Now, to understand this in a more practical way, let us see practical examples of this. The first diagram is quantum dots. As you can see, they are nothing more than dots. And their range is less than 10 nanometer scale. What are those nanorods? As you can see, they are elongated structures, but in nanodimension. Finally, this photo is of nano sheets, the third photo. One of the examples of nano sheet you may be familiar with is graphene. Graphene is basically a single monolayer of graphite. So graphene is actually a nano sheet. Now, why quantum dots? Why quantum dots are to be used in solar cells? Why they are to be used as sensitizers? One thing we have to keep in mind that once we enter the quantum realm, it may, it may seem like a science fiction, but it is not, it is a science. Uh, once we go on reducing the size and uh, reach the quantum level, that is atomic level, the laws of classical physics and the rules of classical physics become null and void. 
and they are governed by new sets of laws and the materials in nano dimension has a completely different behavior compared to that of their bulk counterparts one of the vital point is for any material we know that band gap is a constant constant band gap electronic band gap in material is constant but that is not true in case of quantum dots in quantum dots if we go on reducing the size of a quantum dot of any material the band gap increases the relation is basically uh, e inversely proportional to radius square that is the square of the square of radius that is as we go on reducing the size the band gap e increases in the first diagram we see a representation of how a uh, lead sulfide with uh, decreasing in lead sulfide size increases in band gap see for the bulk uh, lead sulfide bulk means normal lead sulfide specific for normal lead sulfide the band gap is 0.37 electron volt while the uh, conduction band lies at a value of minus 4.74 electron volt now if we remember this structure quantum dot cell solar cell you can see that here the quantum dots are deposited over a layer of oxide now come to uh, come here here we can see uh, the oxide that is tio2 has been the short the band gap. the tio2 has a band gap of 3.2 electron volt and the conduction band gap lies at minus 4.21 electron volt now what will happen if we deposit normal lead sulfide not uh, nano material normal uh, lead sulfide into the oxide the conduction band as we can see lies below that of the conduction band of oxide minus 4.74 electron volt for lead sulfide by minus 4.21 electron volt for oxide now we all know that electron transfer from a lower energy level to higher energy is difficult it cannot be done easily but what happens if we go on reducing the size of lead sulfide for 10 nanometer then 5 nanometer then 3 nanometer see the band gap increases the value of ec that is the conduction band of the uh, lead sulfide increases to minus 3.7 electron volt thus the band ec value the conduction band lies above that of the oxide band now electron can be transferred very easily because electron transfer is very easy from higher to lower energy so this is one of the primary reason why quantum dots are preferred to be deposited on oxide because the uh, electron transfer is much easier for, for a quantum dot and oxide system compared to that of normal material and oxide system of the same material so the advantage that quantum dots provides to us in quantum uh, in solar cell technology is that the band gap can be tuned this is a unique property we cannot tune the band gap of normal material but it is possible in quantum dots we can tune the band gap to match our requirement if we change the oxide we can change the size of quantum dot to match that of the oxide and also uh, quantum dots are stable towards water and oxygen which was the disadvantage of dye sensitized solar cell organic dyes and See, I have mentioned another point that a wider range of solar spectrum can be utilized. Let's see what this means. Here I have shown the spectrum, the solar spectrum. I'm uh, not actually all the uh, wavelengths, but from 400 to nano, the uh, visible range, visible range. Normal solar cells, that is first and second generation solar cells, also the dye solar cells. These three types of cells only operate in this limited range of visible sunlight. While 
the sun sun uh, sun spectrum actually consists of quite a large range including ultraviolet and ir rays which cannot be used so this is one of the main reason why 10000 times of the solar energy is wasted we cannot use that because we don't have that device to use that here comes quantum dot solar cell See, I have mentioned one of the common formula. Everyone, uh, I think, remembers this one. E equal to H C by lambda. That E is the bandwidth, H C is constant, and lambda is the wavelength. So from this formula, we can easily understand that uh, bandwidth is inversely proportional to wavelength, or we can say uh, wavelength is inversely proportional to bandwidth. So what happens in quantum dot is that. Once the particle size reduces, size reduces, see the down arrow, the band gap increases, up arrow, and ultimately the wavelength of absorption goes down because they are inversely proportional. E and lambda are inversely related. So, in quantum dot, the absorption starts from a range of ultraviolet wavelength. That is, using quantum data sensitizers, they they absorb the visible range. They absorb the visible range, but in additionally, they also absorb a range of ultraviolet wavelengths, which are exclusive properties of quantum dots only. None of the other solar cells um, absorb the ultraviolet range. That's why. I have said before that a larger range, a wider spectrum of the solar uh, spectra can be utilized using a quantum dot sensitized solar cell. So now, till now, we have learned the generations of solar cell and how nanotechnology comes in. Now, these are the fabrication steps, the practical fabrication steps of quantum dot solar cell. If whenever we think of uh, fabrication, something comes in our mind. We, we think that uh, it requires a very high sophisticated lab, which uh, most of our Indian institutes don't provide. But it's not exactly true. Application of quantum dot sensitized solar cell is quite to go through the steps. So, first step, we require first is a TCO. TCO is transparent conducting oxide. Uh, what are TCO? Basically, uh, it's a common sense. If you think of a solar cell, one of the cathode or anode, either one, preferably the anode, one of the electrode has to be transparent. Otherwise, the light wouldn't reach the junction of the quantum dot, right? So, one of the electrode is kept transparent, but glass is not conducting. Glass is obviously transparent, but not conducting. So, what we take is either ITO or FTO, that is indium, uh, indium coated tin oxide glass or fluorine doped tin oxide glass. Uh, this is nothing but common glass this layer of IQ and FTO deposited, which makes one of the circuits conducting. Uh, you can get this IQ or TCO through Indian companies. Some of the Indian companies uh, actually manufacture them. Or if you have the lab facility, you can actually fabricate IQs yourself. Anyway, so we start with IQ, that is the photo anode, simple IQ. Then we deposit oxide. Now the oxide, the choice of oxide is actually limited. It is either TiO2, that is titanium dioxide, or ZNO, that is zinc oxide. Sometimes in dioxide, SNO2 is also used. But the choice of oxide is limited because, the, remember, we need to keep the oxide almost transparent. If not completely transparent, we need to keep the oxide material transparent so that light can pass through and reach the quantum dot. So 
example, let's step with deposit the oxide. Uh, deposition method, there are lots of deposition methods. There are quite complex deposition methods. But there are also simple methods like simple uh, tape template and doctor's play. You, will, you can uh, know this method once you uh, Google it. Simple Google it. And it is very easy. Uh, just take the oxide and deposit it using some tips as template. So finally, after depositing, we heat it so that the layer becomes, that paste layer of oxide becomes uh, you know, hard, to harden it with heat. And finally, we obtain uh, what we can see in A. A small portion, in a small portion of the glass, we have deposited oxide. Now, step two. In step two, we have to deposit the quantum dot on this oxide layer. As we have discussed the simplest method. One of the simplest method is by deep coating. We take the oxide deposited glass and we dip it into a solution containing quantum ones. That is CVD, the first step. Chemical bar deposition. We take it, we dip it in a solution containing quantum dots for one minute or two minutes, preferably, and take it out. You can see in the photos, the uh, extreme photos, there is, you can actually note the color change. CDS is generally yellow in color, so the white oxide layer becomes yellow. So we can confirm that uh, quantum dot has been deposited. The other method is silar, that is successive ionic layer absorption and reduction. Uh, this is same as deep coating, only difference is in here, the anionic and cationic solution are separate. That is, for uh, example, if we want to deposit cadmium sulfide, the first we dip, uh, we dip it in a beaker containing the cationic, that is CD solution, and next into the sulfide solution. So the quantum dot CDS is formed in situ on the surface of the oxygen. So we have deposed, uh, we have taken IPO. We have deposited oxide and then we have deposited quantum dot. The photo anode, the photo electrode is complete. Now for the next step, we add few drops of electrolyte. Electrolyte in case of quantum dot solar cell is generally a polysulfide. It is a mixture of 3 molar of sulfur and 2 molar of sodium sulfur. So, in the photo you can see, this is the quantum dot deposited IPO photoelectron and on which we add a few drops. We can actually note the, again a color change because of addition of the photo electron. And for the final step, we sandwich our photo anode with a counter electrode material. Now the counter electrode is nothing but a metal any kind of metal plate, but some use platinum, some use gold. I have used simple low cost aluminum. This is the structure of a final solar cell. In the figure C, you can see an original lab fabricated quantum dot sensitized solar cell. It's very simple. You know the two layers can be kept together using simple duct tapes or paper clips. This is a lab fabricated solar cell. And if we take a cross-sectional microscopic view, you can see this layer separately. And now compare it with the diagram. First, there is glass. Then there is the TCO. In this case, it is the FTO. Next, we have the oxide layer, that is zinc oxide, 90 nanometer. And then a cadmium sulfide quantum dot layer of about 200 nanometer. And finally, we can see the counter electrode. Okay. So, so, we have successfully learned how to successfully uh, fabricate a quantum dot solar cell. And you can see the steps are not exactly that complicated as we generally have in mind. This is quite easy. We come to working of a quantum dot solar cell. 
How does a quantum refusal cell work? This is the structure as mentioned earlier. There is a DCO. There is oxide deposited on it, on which there is quantum dot, and on the other side there is the cathode or the counter electron. Now, when photon falls from the left, that is from the DCO side, transparent side, and reaches the quantum dot, what happens due to photovoltaic effect is exactly that is the effect when photon falls on the electron in quantum dot the electron gets excited and jumps from the balance band to that of the conduction band balance band to conduction band the, the electron jumps due to photon photonic effect and then as we have seen in quantum dots see the uh, conduction band gap lies above that of the conduction band gap of oxide, the electron easily jumps to the oxide conduction band gap. And then the electron jumps from the oxide to that of the photoelectron. And the electron travels to the outside, outside circuit to reach the cathode where it is in, again united through a redox reaction with the hole, thus completing the whole circuit. This is the working of a quantum dot sensitized solar cell. So, we have learned that there is uh, how to fabricate a quantum dot solar cell and how does it work. But as we know, scientists are never satisfied. So, scientists came up with new problems. Now, they are not satisfied with just making or fabricating a quantum dot solar cell. They want to increase the efficiency. Now, we'll discuss few techniques on how, how using nanotechnology, we can increase the efficiency of solar cells further. First point, increasing the, in, F, increasing the efficiency of solar cell by modifying the oxide surface. On TCO, we deposit an oxide flim, thin flim. Now, the area of thin flim is limited. Now, this is by common sense, we can say that more the number of quantum dots, more will be the light absorption and as a result, more will be the efficiency of the cell. But the problem is, where would you uh, deposit the quantum dots? Uh, two-dimensional surface has a uh, limited area, right? So, scientists came up with the idea, let us, uh, let us replace oxide thin flame with nano rods. Now, see in the second diagram, what happens if we add nano rods? Using nano rods, the area increases, area of the oxide, total area increases. As a result, more and more number of quantum dots can be deposited on the nano rods compared to that of thin flames. And it has been proven that for any material, if we replace the thin flame oxide with nano rods, the efficiency jumps quite uh, amount. Quite a there is quite an increase in efficiency. By using nano rods. To get a more practical view, let's see some practical photos that is, uh, transmission electron microscopy photos. The first diagram shows nano rod arrays deposited on a uh, TCO glass, elongated forms. In the second diagram, is just a zoomed version of the same photo, 100 nanometer range. And in the third photo, the down below, we can actually see the deposited quantum dots if we focus more on a single nano rod. Until uh, uh, this image with the second second image, these are the nano rods on which quantum dots are deposited. This is the microscopic image. We can actually see the quantum dots. This is one of the method. Uh, this is one of the vital method for increasing efficiency that most of the researchers use. Now we come to the second method. 
this is actually I uh, this is one of uh, the methods I used that is doping of sensitizing quantum dots with transition metal ions because I found fabricating of nano rods is quite difficult quite difficult with uh, limited resources so I took up this technique doping of sensitized solar cell using transition metal ions now the question is why transition metal ions why not any other metal the reason lies in the atomic structure of transition metal ions. Uh, you see, I have added here the transition metal ions uh, general electronic configuration. That is argon, that is a noble gas used to represent the rest of the part. And in the ultimate cell, there is an S electron, and in the penultimate cell, there is D. Ns and n minus one d. In transition metal ions are unique. Transition metals in the periodic table has a unique property that when photon falls on them, instead of releasing the d electron first, the s electrons are removed first. The s uh, electron from s orbitals are removed, leaving behind unpaired d electrons. Now this D electron is unpaired and is ready to move to some place else. So what happens in transition metal ion is that uh, there is a phenomenon called photo assisted DD transition. Photo assisted that is when photon falls on them. The electron from one of the D orbital DD that is from moves from one D orbital to next D orbital, the adjacent D orbital of another uh, transition metal ion. So, if we dope the quantum dots with transition metal ion, along with the electrons produced from the oxide due to uh, photovoltaic effect, the additional this uh, D electron, additional D electrons are produced in case of doped quantum dots. As a result, as the number of electron increases, the total current increases. In the two photos, we can see lead sulfide quantum dots uh, synthesized in colloidal form and the copper doped quantum uh, lead sulfide quantum dot. Actually, on doping, there is a visible change in color. If you notice, the black precipitate is always indicated indication of lead sulfide quantum dot and if we dope it with copper chloride, uh, preferably copper chloride for copper doping, there is slight change in color, it becomes a bit transparent. Similarly, here we have seen uh, in the second photo, there is cadmium sulfide quantum dots which is yellow in color and if we dope it with magnesium, magnesium ion which is another transition metal ion, uh, the color changes to bluish. Now, we have used this doped quantum dots as sensitizers and have compared it with undoped quantum dots. Except the result. What happens? See, for undoped lead sulfide quantum dots in the first, uh, first row, the efficiency is 2.07% for undoped. Now, for 5% manganese doped lead sulfide with the same device and under same uh, solar, light con uh, solar light condition, the efficiency is 4.13%, almost doubled. This is the advantage of doping of transition metal ion. The efficiency almost doubles for doping. But if you think that if we go on increasing the doping, and you will get uh, unlimited efficiency, it doesn't happen. That is the difference between a practical work and theoretical uh, prediction. Theoretically, it can be predicted easily that, okay, if we go and open, uh, efficiency will increase. But practically, we found something else. See, in the last column, if we increase that open to 10%, 5% to 10%, the efficiency actually starts reducing can also be seen in the time density voltage uh, diagram curve. 
for 10%, the current value actually decreases from 14.5 uh, for 14.7. Uh, no. So why? Why on additional doping there is a reduction in current? To understand this, let us get back to this working, working of quantum dot solution. When light falls on quantum dot, electron has to move from balance band to conduction band in quantum dot. But on excess doping, what happens is that there are intermediate energy bands form in between the valence band and conduction band in quantum dots. Now due to this intermediate band, intermediate energy gaps, they act as electron traps. That is, when light falls on quantum dot, the electron instead of moving from valence band to conduction band, they get trapped in between in the intermediate band gaps. As a result, the electron the uh, electron flow from the quantum dot to oxide is reduced because quantum uh, the electron doesn't actually reach the conduction band gap on high doping. That is why doping is a preferable method. Yes, doping increases efficiency, but it has a limit. Beyond a certain doping concentration, you cannot increase the doping. In that case, the efficiency actually goes on reducing. Now, for the third part. The third part is ion irradiator, ion irradiator of the quantum dots. This is basically one of the more sophisticated method of doping. In this, we expose the synthesized quantum dots to high speed ions, transition metal ions. Now the dosage of the Irradiation uh, value, amount of irradiation actually depends on the exposure time. You can see in the table uh, for 16 second uh, exposure, about 10 to the power 11 ions per centimeter square hits the quantum dot crystal. Now, yes, we have obtained a uh, better result using ion irradiated quantum dot. But as, as it is the rule of nature, there is always a downside to every good thing. Here also, if we increase the exposure time, that is if we increase the ion, do, uh, ion dose, what happens is that uh, due to collision of these heavy ions with that of the quantum dots, it produces heat. As a result, the quantum dot starts melting. And one of the, and a quantum dot on melting actually agglomerates. That is, the sticks with the adjacent quantum dot, and uh, their size actually increases. See in the photos, in A, there is the first dosage. For B, this is the second dosage. C for the third dose, and D for the uh, final fourth dose. You can actually visibly see the size increase in quantum dot. That is, two quantum dots are actually melting and fusing into uh, itself. Now, this is not, not preferable because if the quantum dot size increases, again the problem with band gap reduction comes in. We don't want that. We want the size of quantum dot to be small and band gap to be high. So, in practical case, we have found that ion irradiation doesn't work beyond second dosage. Beyond second doses, the size becomes so large that uh, it loses the quantum dot effect and the sample actually burns or melts. But the final result using irradiated quantum dots are quite better than that of the chemically doped. This is a comparative analysis. See, uh, lead sulfide quantum dots, undoped or unirradiated has a 2.99 efficiency. For copper dope, simple chemical dope, the efficiency is about 3.52 percent. For irradiated, the uh, efficiency jumps further to 4.39 percent. Thus, this is one of uh, one of the most efficient method for increasing the efficiency. Uh, now we come to the end, but before ending the uh, this video. 
let us think of other ways now i mean if you want if as a researcher you want to work with quantum dot solar cells nanotechnology what are the avenues open to you so the future research but firstly um, you can find some nano structures novel nano structures that has higher surface area than that of nano rocks for example recently researchers are working with nano spikes or nano flowers they are making some uh, flower like structures on nano rays that has even higher surface area than that of nano rocks or nano rocks and as a result the efficiency of solar cell increases if we if we can increase the uh, surface area of nano structure obviously the efficiency will increase this is one of the part uh, secondly you can use photoping method that is uh, for example i have shown you that you can use transition metal and doping copper or nickel or zinc what if we mix and match some of the researchers are working on uh, co doping that is they are doping the quantum dot with copper as well as magnesium or nickel with mag uh, manganese like this Uh, some of the results have actually shown that using co-dop quantum dots results in a better efficiency than normally doped quantum dots. Uh, thirdly, there is the irradiation of quantum dots. The irradiating of quantum dots is basically a very noble concept. A noble concept. It was first proposed in 2018 only in my paper. Uh, if so, I have until date used only nickel and copper. so if you are interested you can go for other materials other uh, transition metals but yes it takes sophisticated instruments and finally the fourth alternative is you can research on better counter electrode and electrolyte material this is one of the uh, greatest disadvantage of quantum dot solar cell you know the counter electrode and electrolyte are the main reason why uh, they are not uh, good for quantum dot solar cells as they are good for other solar cells so if you can come up with something new something new kind of material for quantum dots or of the electrolyte or the counter electrode then definitely it will be a breakthrough and as new researchers who have to come to this uh, path because we don't have a way we, we need to find alternate energy sources as we have discussed earlier so these are the references and with that come to the end uh, thank you now if you have any questions feel free to ask